1998, I was a year out of high school, and I had been a LARPer, a live role player, for a few years. I'd organized eight or nine fantasy games myself, the kind where you dress up as sort of fantasy heroes and run around in the forest and, and fight and do medieval-type diplomacy and so on. And I was asked to go to Turku in Finland to play a game by, by two gentlemen called uh, Jami Jokinen and Jori Virtanen. And the game was called Ground Zero, uh, an expression that didn't have the same connotations, of course, then as it does today. They said this game was going to be set in Tulsa, Oklahoma, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, and we were going to play ordinary families. Tulsa is one of those places we found out where, uh, which would be a target in the case of a nuclear war. And during the Cold War, it turns out, a lot of quite ordinary American families uh, had built fallout shelters in their back gardens and so on. And this game was set in a suburban area outside of Tulsa, where ordinary families, neighbors, um, would go out down into their bomb shelter when the Cuban Missile Crisis was, was coming to a head. We were, obviously most of us were grown-ups, we thought then, uh, which means at least 18 years old, and we didn't have any actual child players, and you shouldn't bring any kids into a game about, uh, about a bomb anyway. But the youngest looking player got to play a, a sort of uh, mentally disabled uh, teenager, so we had one person to represent the sort of um, innocence, I guess. Uh, and otherwise, we played people of different ages, with as realistic life histories as we, could, as we could research on the early days of the internet. And we played ordinary people. I was a school teacher, for instance. My, my husband was, uh, was uh, or the guy who played, my husband played a person who was a, a, a war veteran and afraid of loud noises. We went down into this basement, and it was made to look like a bomb shelter. There was a whole wall of cardboard boxes c containing the tinned food that we were going to eat in case of a nuclear war. And there was a radio that gave us the news and played patriotic music, and we could hear the speeches of the president, and some of these were hist historical, of course, and some of them were not. And before the game, we were told that this might be a historical game, in which case, of course, the crisis is averted and nuclear war doesn't happen. But it might also be a uchronic game, in which, in which uh, case an alternative history erupts. Um, and we were like, yeah, yeah. Because how could they possibly stage a nuclear war? There's just no way, right? So, so we thought, they're just saying this to give us like, an opportunity to be a little bit excited. Yeah, that's what we thought. So we went down in there, and we were following the radio, and the situation was getting worse and worse politically. And then we lost the radio because something was happening, the conflict was getting worse. And then we lost electricity, and we put on the little candles, and we were cooking our little beans on a on a little camper kitchen. And then uh, the bomb fell on Tulsa. We were still alive, right? We were still in this basement. So how did we know? Like, how did we know at, in this LARP situation what had happened? Well, <laughs> they built a special effect. That whole wall of cardboard boxes that we hadn't opened, because you don't open the cardboard boxes, because it's scenography, right? You know they're going to be empty, but they weren't empty. They were filled with loud, loudspeakers the whole war. <laughs> so, so they made a bomb sound. Actually, they blew out like three of the speakers because the, the sound was too loud, but it was still pretty damn loud. And we had just cooked our little bean meal, and we just dropped all our plates and screamed, and some people cried. And the guy who played my husband said later that he had trained himself to be af afraid of loud, loud noises, and if he hadn't gone to the bathroom like an hour before, he would have absolutely sold himself in that situation. It's funny now, but it's not actually that funny, because, because we were really afraid. And I remember a very bright light, and which couldn't possibly have been there, so that's something that my mind has edited in, edited in after. And, uh, and I remember very clearly that, that this 90s Finnish pop song about, a, about, a, about the gates of he heaven opening uh, was playing in my, in my mind, and I was thinking, this is so inappropriate for this historical setting. But at the same time, it was emotionally appropriate for the experience that I was having. Um, we, we didn't die, and the game didn't end, so clearly we were survivors of a nuclear attack, so we kept playing for another 12 hours, knowing that the city wasn't there, and probably that everybody we knew were dead. And then the Game Masters came in at the end and said, the end! 
And then we came out and cried for a couple of days, like, oh, it's such an emotional experience. And it was an emotional experience. Of course, as a sort of cathartic, cathartic, thing, cathartic thing, it was um, extremely intense, much more extreme than anything I've ever experienced at the theater. Um, a few years later, we, uh, I was watching the, the news and some bombs were falling again over Baghdad. And it was just like the night sky with the lights coming down. And I had this weird flash, not exactly a flashback, not a, not a flashback to the game, but I had like a flash, like an image of actual families beneath those houses taking shelter. I don't presume to know from having played a LARP in a basement in Turku with my friends anything about what it's like to be a participant in a war. But somehow experiencing this thing with my physical body had made it much more real and had helped me understand a little bit about what the experiences can be like for other people. I belong to the ludic generation, the generation, the playful generation or the gamer generation. These are images that would have been meaningful to me in the early 80s. Uh, actually, the roots of this go, go down to the 70s. And, and, um, and now today we think of games very much of the digital games, which had their root, uh, which were born more or less at the same time. But for a long time uh, in the 80s, role-playing games uh, were the dominant form of, of game enter mainstream game entertainment. I didn't play Drakar och Demoner, uh, even though many people in my age group did, because there was a very unfortunate gender bias towards male players at this time. The thing is, these role-playing games were commercial systems. You bought a box, and then you had a rule book, and then you had your adventure set, and then you took it out, and then you sat around the table, and one person was the game master who like, ran the game and told the story for the others, and they decided what to do for what their characters would do in any given situation. And these were commercial products. But, uh, some people like to say that whenever you role-play, just the participatory act in itself is a revolution against top-down culture. And it's very strange how role-playing games really had a yearning to get out of that box. They wouldn't stay in the cardboard. So people would make up their own rule systems. They're like, oh, this is clunky. We could make better rules with like, even more pages and even more dice, or we can make rules that have no rules at all, and we're just going to talk to each other, and it's going to be better. And oh, we can figure out our own adventure setting using these commercial worlds. Actually, we can make our own worlds. We can do that. We can, instead of saying, my character does this, I can say, I do this, I do that. I, the dwarf, so-and-so do this. Actually, I can wave my arms while I talk, or I can get up from my chair and I can act out what I'm doing. We wouldn't, the stories wouldn't be contained to this storytelling setting, and the imagination wouldn't be contained to the commercial product. And very, very fast, and this is interesting because this happened independently everywhere in the world that had been exposed to role-playing games, live role-playing games emerged independently of each other. You have to remember this is before the internet. So basically, people just put on some costumes, and then they went out, and they acted out the same stories uh, live, so to speak, hence the name. Live action role-playing games, or LARPs. And LARP is, is a term that you're going to hear a lot today. Um, in some places, you would think maybe this was an effect of something cultural that was happening in the late 70s and early 80s. But that doesn't seem to be the case, because, because in Eastern Europe, after the end of the Cold War, uh, the same development has happened, except much faster. So in the, during uh, the, the Lord of the Rings, for instance, wasn't available in a lot of countries behind the Iron Curtain, so it was translated into, for instance, Czech um, as late as 1990. And role-playing games happen, start in the Czech, Czech Republic also, at the same time, and they've done the exact same journey, but 20 years faster. So now they have all the exact same kinds of LARPs as, as we do in the rest of Europe. Fantasy role-playing was and is still the dominant form. The first commercial uh, live role-playing system to get uh, very widely distributed was called World of Darkness, and was set in a, story of uh, in a world of vampires, vampire clans, and that's still very, very popular. But something else happened in the Nordic countries. And there are some reasons for this. We have uh, a very good system uh, of a social safety net. We have very good funding available for students, so you can be a student for a long time without, breaking, without becoming indebted to a point where it's impossible for you to have a life in the future. So you can study very slowly and use your free, free time for artistic endeavors. We have funding available for youth culture projects and for participatory art projects from forward-thinking public uh, grant organizations. 
and we have a public right uh, to use the land. You, we, even private land can be used by anyone who wants, and this is pretty rare in the world. And that means that if you wanted to go into a forest, it doesn't matter so much who uses it. As long as you don't break the forest, you can go there and pretend to be a troll if that's what you want to be. Um, so very, very fast, uh, there was a, a creative development and the raising uh, of the stakes uh, in the Nordic countries. And, and here we have, this is, all, this is the mid-90s already, this is ages ago, uh, uh, a 20s game with occult elements. Okay, now I'm going to tell you how to make a LARP. Uh, it doesn't matter if you haven't done one before, because you can make a birthday party, and I'm going to argue that it's exactly the same thing. If you want to make a birthday party, you're going to need a place and a time, like a setting, so to speak. You're going to need perhaps a theme. You're going to want to have some food. You're going to have to manage the expectations of the people who are coming to this party so they know how to dress and what, what kind of party it's going to be. Is it going to be a sit-down dinner? Is it going to be the kind of thing where you vomit at the end of it? You wanna, you're going to want to have some decorations. You wanna gonna, you're going to want to have some entertainments, maybe a soundtrack. And then you're going to want to invite some friends. But now, in this hypothetical scenario, you don't have any friends. You have zero friends, but you still want to make the birthday party. So what do you do? You figure out what kind of friends would be at your birthday party if you had one. You're going to need some people to stand, to stand smoking in the balcony. You're going to need some people, some girls sitting on the floor in the kitchen talking about their lives. You're going to need some. You're going to need that guy who always breaks something in the bathroom randomly, like a sink or something. And you're going to need the person who's going to sleep with your brother. You're going to need a brother, obviously, for this to work out. <laughs> and you're going to have to talk some people in to come and play these people at your party. Uh, you can't pay them because you don't have any budget because you're making a live role-playing game, actually, and not a party, really. Okay, so you round off these people, you give them their character descriptions. Who are they? Where are they from? How do they know you? Why are they at the party? Who else do they know at the party? What do they want to achieve? You ask them to dress up appropriately. Perhaps there are specific events that you would want to happen, like a male strippergram arrives, or, or you run out of ice and you make a heroic run to the gas station with somebody that you didn't know very well, but then you can have a meaningful conversation under the stars that's going to become a real friendship or something like that. Yeah, you can do that. Uh, in the real world, if you want these kinds of things to happen at your party, there are ways like suggestions or manipulation or money that you can make these things come about. Uh, in a LARP, you can also make things happen by very discreet means. Uh, this is called game design. You also have the benefit that you know all the people, you know all their secrets and their backgrounds and their goals, so actually you have an overview that they don't have. The individual player doesn't know necessarily what all the others want to achieve, so that helps. Um, you've made the party, and uh, the players have brought themselves and studied their characters, and they brought their costumes, and they've brought the gifts, of course, that they're going give, to give, bring you, and so on. And, uh, and then the question is, what happens? What happens to me if I'm a player at your party game? Well. I get my character description, I'm like, oh, I'm so-and-so, I'm Johanna, and I've known you for five years, and this is our back history, and this is why I'm coming to your party, and we haven't been in touch lately, but I want to... Whatever. Whatever it is. Once the game starts, let's say, perhaps once I arrive at your party, I'm free to behave in any way I want. And think of it, this is just like in real life. This is just like at a party. I'm, I'm free to behave in any way I want, except there are still all kinds of social rules that I got to adhere to. It's the same thing with the game. Right now, I'm not, I mean, if I go to a LARP, obviously I'm going to play somebody who's a visitor at somebody's party, unless that's the topic of the, of the, of the LARP, but I'm still going to be following specific rules that we've agreed on in advance. This isn't very scary. We do this all the time. Probably I'm going to have some room to improvise, just as I would at... A real party, I, I can select, I can talk to any of the people, or I can talk to all of them, or I can talk to nobody and sit and be the person who sulks in a corner. You have similar options in a game situation. And events will evolve, things will emerge. And some of the things that emerge will probably be something that the organizer of the party, or in this case of the game, has planned, and some of them will not, but all of them will be interesting. And even if it fails, it'll be interesting. A party in the real world that's boring, isn't actually very fun to go to. If it's embarrassing and awful things happen, it's like, uh. But if you go to a LARP where you pretend to be at a, gay, at a party and everything is boring and it's embarrassing, that's kind of interesting. You're like, ooh, interesting. This is like a story about a failed party. Ooh, this is what it feels like. This, it, like if this was actually me, this would be so embarrassing now. 
be. But uh, since it's not me, I'm just going to take off my clothes and dance it on this table, or whatever it, it is. Okay. Now let's make another LARP. Since it's all fiction anyway, and making LARP is this easy, why don't make it another kind of party? Let's make it Bilbo's birthday party from The Lord of the Rings. Let's make it Helge's birthday party from the Danish movie The Celebration. In fact, why make it a party at all? Why not make it something completely different? Let's make it a slum in a dystopian future. Let's make it a sort of road movie where a brotherhood of hobos are, are walking down a white road to a place where they can scatter the ashes of a dead friend. Let's make it a group of civil war refugees uh, at an asylum center in an inhospitable country at the other end of Europe. Let's make it a fantasy village ruled by a fi fire-breathing dragon the size of a house. And you know Tony Soprano, when he has like that poker game with his friends, wouldn't that be an awesome, awesome table to be at? We've done that. Not with Tony Soprano, we made other mobsters. It's called the executive game, and you can go there and be that mobster in that room. Deadwood. Deadwood, pretty cool TV show. We've done that, yeah. Wild West settlement with no rules. Great scenario, great LARP environment. Mad Men, yeah, we love Mad Men, haven't done that yet, but very, very similar issues were uh, explored at a game set in a sort of millennial communications consultancy called Panopticore. Haven't you all wanted to visit fictional worlds? You read Jane Austen or P.G. Woodhouse or Ursula Le Guin or Shakespeare or Ibsen, and it's just not enough? You feel like, I want to be there, I would like to be there? Well, we can do that. We've done that. These places are open for us to explore with our bodies. These, peop these are other people's fictions, but of course, we also write our own fictions in the LARP community. Some people write games that are set in bomb shelters during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And some people build dragons the size of houses <laughs> on top of forestry machines. You can see there's the forestry machine. And like, if a human was placed on, for scale here, it'd be about the size of that dot. Yeah, that happens. We do that. Nobody gets paid, by the way. This is all volunteer work. Um, Nordic LARP has moved more and more in a direction where everything, you want to create the perfect virtual illusion, everything has to be perfect. The, everything, what you see is what you get. What you smell is what you smell. What you hear is what you hear. And we've become pretty good at this. The social experience, of course, is slightly different because you're still going to have trouble remembering what your neighbor's called because you haven't actually lived together in, in uh, 50 years, but it's pretty close to a real experience. We also do other things now. Use abstract spaces, use symbolic events, play in empty, on empty stages like at the theater, but except without an audience. Play non-chronological stories and so on. This happens. We're going to talk about all of these things today. So the question is, are these even games? I don't know the answer to that. Uh, but they're probably not games. They're not games in the sense that, that there's a competition involved. Is this theater? Well, no, it's not theater because, because the audience position is placed inside the body of one of the characters. And that is completely different. The text ends up being somewhere else. The text isn't between you all in the room. It isn't something you can view from the outside. The text of the game is different to each individual and you can only see it from inside the player. Is it art? Yeah, but it's kind of a folk art, <laughs> mostly. And even when it's very, very good, and even when it's of a high intellectual and artistic standard, it's closer to the collective art traditions. It's something like Fluxus or the Situationists, uh, Relational Aesthetics, um, Gesamtkunstwerk, the Theater of Cruelty. LARPers read about these things and we're like, yeah, I know that. Yeah, I've done that. Uh, the text, again, of course, is in a different place. So maybe it's not art in that sense. Um, it's related to other things, I think. Shamanistic ritual, church weddings, test cricket, theatrical productions, job interviews, parliamentary debates, hen parties, a charter trip to Marbella. In some ways, all of these are role-playing games. You have a magic circle. The rules are different on the inside and the outside. It has an end and a beginning in time. And you go in there, and you're yourself, and you become somebody else for the duration. And you come out of there, and you're yourself again, but you're, you're, you're changed. Not a lot, but you're changed, because fictional experiences, when experienced on our bodies, are also real. Thank you. <laughs>